Purgatory Explained, Chapter 48, in Part 2 Advantages, Temporal Favors The Neapolitan Woman and the Mysterious Note To prove that the souls in Purgatory show their gratitude even by temporal favors, Father Rossignoli relates a fact that happened in, at Naples which bears some resemblance to that which we have just read. If it is not given to all to offer to God the abundant alms of Judas Maccabeus, who sent 12,000 drachms to Jerusalem for sacrifices and prayers to be offered in behalf of the dead, there are very few who cannot at least make the offering of the poor widow of the gospel who was praised by our Savior himself. She gave only two mites, but, said Jesus, these two mites were of more value than all the gold of the rich because she of her want cast in all she had even her whole living. Mark twelve forty four. This touching example was imitated by a humble Neapolitan woman who had the greatest difficulty in providing for the wants of her family. The resources of the house depended upon the daily earnings of the husband, who each evening brought home the fruits of his labors, Alas, one day this poor father was imprisoned for debt, so that the responsibility of supporting the family rested upon the unhappy mother, who possessed nothing but her confidence in God. With faith, she besought divine providence to come to her aid, and especially to deliver her husband, who languished in prison for no other crime than his poverty. She went to a wealthy and benevolent gentleman, and relating to him the sad story of her woes, entreated him with tears to assist her. God permitted that she should receive but a trifling alms, a carlin, a piece of money worth about ten cents of our coin. Deeply afflicted, she entered a church to implore the God of the indignant, of the indigent, to succor her in her distress, since she had nothing to hope from earth. She was absorbed in prayers and tears, when, by an inspiration, no doubt, of her good angel, it occurred to her to interest the sympathy of the holy souls in her behalf, for she had heard much of their sufferings and of their gratitude toward those who befriend them. Full of confidence, she went to the sacristy, offered her little piece of money, and asked if a mass could be celebrated for the dead. The good priest who was there hastened to say mass for her intention and ascended the altar for that purpose, whilst the poor woman, prostrate straight on the pavement, assisted at the holy sacrifice, offering her prayers for the departed. She returned quite consoled, as though she had received the, ins- the assurance that God had heard her prayer. Whilst traversing the populous streets of Naples, she was accosted by a venerable old man who inquired whence she came and whither she was going. The unfortunate woman explained her distress and the use she had made of the small alms she had received. The old man seemed deeply touched by her misery, spoke some words of encouragement, and gave her a note enclosed in an envelope which he directed her to take to a gentleman whom he designated, and then left her. 
The woman went in all haste to deliver the note to the gentleman indicated. The latter, on opening the envelope, was seized with astonishment and was on the point of fainting away. He recognized the handwriting of his father, who had died some time previous. Where did you get this letter? he cried, quite beside himself. Sir, replied the good woman, it was from an old man who accosted me in the street. I told him of my distress, and he sent me to give you this note in his name. As regards his features, he, was very, he very much resembles that portrait which you have over the door. More and more impressed by these circumstances, the gentleman again took up the note and read aloud, My son, your father has just been delivered from purgatory, thanks to a mass which the bearer has had celebrated this morning. She is in great, great distress, and I recommend her to you. He read and reread those lines, traced by that hand so dear to him, by a father who was now among the number of the elect. Tears of joy coursed down his cheeks as he turned toward the woman. Poor woman, he said, by your trifling alms you have secured the eternal felicity of him who gave me life. In my turn I will secure your temporal happiness. I take upon myself to supply all the needs of yourself and your whole family. What joy for that gentleman! What joy for that poor woman! It is difficult to say on which side was the greatest happiness. What is most important and most easy is to see the instruction to be derived from this incident. It teaches us that the smallest act of charity toward the members of the church suffering is precious in the sight of God. And draws down upon us miracles of mercy. Purgatory Explained, Part 2, Chapter 49 Advantages, Spiritual and Temporal Favors Let us here cite another example, the more worthy of mention as a great pope Clement the Eighth saw therein the finger of God and recommended its publication for the edification of the church. Several authors, says Father Rasignali, have related the marvelous assistance which Christopher Sandoval, Archbishop of Seville, received from the souls in purgatory. While still a child, he was accustomed to distribute part of his pocket money and alms for the benefit of the holy souls. His piety increased with his age. For the sake of the poor suffering souls, he gave away all he could dispose of, and even went so far as to deprive himself of a thousand little things which were useful or necessary. When he was pursuing his studies at the University of Louvain, it happened that some letters which he expected from Spain were delayed, in consequence of which he found himself reduced to such pecuniary, pecuniary states that straits that he had scarcely wherewith to purchase food. At this moment, a poor person asked him an alms for love of the souls in purgatory. And what had never happened to him before, he was obliged to refuse. Afflicted by this circumstance, he went into the church. If, he said, I cannot give alms for my poor souls, I can at least give them the assistance of my prayers. Scarcely had he finished his prayer, 
When on leaving the church, he was accosted by a beautiful young man, dressed as a traveler, who saluted him with respectful affability. Christopher experienced a feeling of religious awe, as though he were in the presence of this, a spirit in human form. But he was soon reassured by his amiable interlocutor, who spoke to him with great, the greatest gentleness of the Marquis of Dania, his father, his relatives and friends, just as a Spaniard who had recently arrived from the peninsula. He en ended by begging him to accompany him to a hotel where they could dine together and be more at their ease. Sandoval, who had not eaten anything since the previous day, gladly accepted the, off the offer. They therefore seated themselves at table and continued to converse most pleasantly together. After the repast, the stranger gave Sandoval a sum of money, entreating him to accept it and to make use of it for any purpose he pleased, adding that the Marquis, his father, would make him compensation on his return to Spain. Then, under pretext of transacting some business, he withdrew, and Christopher never saw him again. Notwithstanding all his inquiries concerning the stranger, he never succeeded in obtaining any information regarding him. No one, neither in Louvain or Spain, had ever seen or known a young man corresponding to his description. As regards the sum of money, it was exactly the amount which the pious Christopher needed to defray expenses until the arrival of his letters, and this money was never afterwards claimed from his family. He was, therefore, convinced that heaven had worked a miracle in his favor and had sent to his assistance one of those souls that he himself had relieved by his prayers and alms. He was confirmed by, in this opinion by Pope Clement VIII, to whom he related, related the incident when he went to Rome to receive the bulls, raising him to the episcopate. This pontiff, struck by the extraordinary ex circumstances of the case, advised him to make it known for the edification of the faithful. He looked upon it as a favor from heaven, which proved how precious in the sight of God is charity toward the departed. Such is the gratitude of the holy souls which have left this world that they testify it even for favors bestowed upon them whilst they were still in this life. It is related in the Annals of the Friars Preachers, Malvenda, 1241, that among those who went to receive the habit from the hands of St. Dominic in 1221, there was a lawyer who had quitted his profession under extraordinary circumstances. He was united by ties of friendship to a young man of great piety, whom he charitably assisted during the sickness of which he died. This was sufficient to move the deceased to procure for him the greatest of all benefits, that of conversion and vocation to a religious life. About 30 days after his death, he appeared to the lawyer and implored his assistance because he was in pur purgatory. Are your sufferings intense? he asked of his friend. Alas, replied the latter, if the whole earth with its forest and mountains were on fire, it would not form a furnace such as the one into which I am plunged. 
seized with fear. His faith revived, and thinking only of his own soul, he asked, In what state am I in the eyes of God? <clears throat> in bad state, replied the deceased, and in dangerous profession. And in a dangerous profession. What have I to do? What advice do you give me? Quit the perverse world in which you are engaged and occupy yourself only with the affairs of your soul. The lawyer, following his counsel, gave all his goods to the poor and took the habit of St. Dominic. Let us see how a holy religious of the Society of Jesus showed his gratitude even after death to the physician who attended him during his last illness. Francis Lackey, a brother coadjutor, died in the College of Naples in 1598. He was a man of God, full of charity, patience, and tender devotion toward the Blessed Virgin. Some time after his death, Dr. Verdiano entered the church of the college to assist at Mass before beginning his visits. It was the day on which we were celebrated the obsequies of King Philip II, who had died four months previous. When on leaving the church, he was about to take holy water, a religious approached and asked him why the catafalque had been prepared and whose was the service about to be celebrated. It is that of King Philip II, he replied. At the same time, Verdiano, astonished that a religious should ask such a question of a stranger and not distinguishing the features of his interlocutor in the obscurity of the place where he stood, asked who he was. I am, he answered, Brother Lackey, whom you attended during my last illness. The doctor looked at him attentively and recognized perfectly the features of Lackey. Stupefied with astonishment, he said, But you died of that disease. Are you then suffering in purgatory, or do you come to ask our suffrages? Blessed be God, I am no longer in pain nor sorrow. I need not your suffrages. I am in the joys of paradise. And King Philip, is he already in paradise? Yes, he is there, but placed as much below me as he was elevated above me upon earth. As for you, Dr. Verdiano, where do you propose to make your first visit today? Verdiano, having replied that he was then going to the patrician de Mayo, who was dangerously ill, Lackey warned him to guard against the great danger which menaced him at the door of the house. In fact, the doctor found there a large stone so placed that on being shaken it would have fallen and mortally injured him. This material circumstance seems to have been designed by Providence to prove to Verdiano that he had not been the sport of an illusion. <clears throat>